We're, uh, we're in a series right now called Ready to Rumble. We're talking about spiritual warfare, um, which sounds like such an intense subject because it is such an intense subject. Uh, the reality is, is there is a, a spiritual realm that is out there. You, you can't deny it. It is real. I mean, when I, when I look at this earth and I look at the complexity of it, I mean, everything from the way an eyeball is made to how seasons rise and fall, the complexity of this world tells me that it didn't happen just by accident, that there had to have been a, a creator that made this creation take place. And when I look around this world, which a creator has made, I, I look and there are some things that are jacked up. Any of y'all ever witnessed things that are just messed up in this world? And you're like, how does such evil happen? And it's because, like, evil is a real thing. But I also see there's goodness found. I'm like, man, there are some great things happening in this world. And I'm so excited that there's an opportunity just to see what God is like in this world. We have kind of the, the devil on one shoulder. We have an angel on the other shoulder. And there's this wrestle that happens in the spiritual realm, whether you're aware of it or not. And so we're taking six weeks and we're rolling through this passage found in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. And I told you guys we were going to read this thing as a church all six weeks of this series. So let's go ahead and toss it up on the screen, and uh, we're going to go old school for a minute. We're going to stand up one last time until we stand up again at the end of service. But right now, we're going to stand up the second to last time. We're going to read this passage together in honor of God's Word, Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Lord, would you use this word to equip us to be salt and light in this world, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Go ahead and... Uh, Grab a seat again. How many of y'all can resonate with this statement? The struggle is real. We got a bunch of struggle bus people found in this church. No, y'all are some good people. I've seen you guys struggle a little bit, but you make it through pretty well. Uh, the struggle is real sometimes. And I think that even more than that, the spiritual struggle is extremely, extremely real. And we talk about the things that we go through and that we work through and that we try to figure out. There is really so much of life is tied into the spiritual realm, which is why we're looking at this passage. And I think it's so important for our life and our church. So I asked these three questions last week, and it helps us give context to this message. Um, the first one is who wrote this particular letter? Uh, his name is Paul, the Apostle Paul. He was known as a Christian killer. He got saved and became the person who co-authored the majority of the New Testament. And he wrote this book, the book of Ephesians, to the church at Ephesus. And I know that some of you, like it all clicked in your mind. You're like, that's why it's called the book of Ephesians. Like you all get it now. He wrote it to um, the Ephesians in Ephesus, and that's why it's called the book of Ephesians. And the context of it is there was a church that was growing. There was a church that was thriving, and they were battling spiritual warfare. And so at the end of this book, he takes time to write this passage that we just read from Ephesians chapter 6, and that is the portion that we're going through. You know, when I was Looking at this passage, uh, it reminded me of a, a story of this old World War II vet. And he was celebrating um, Fourth of July with his family, doing what a lot of people do. You know, you gather family over, you fire up the grill, you eat ridiculous amounts of meat, and you blow things up in the sky because that's how we celebrate America, right? And in the middle of this celebration, the devil himself walks in. People are freaking out and like fireworks are going over and people are running away from the grill and everybody evacuates except for this old dude who's just sitting in a rocking chair. 
He's just like rocking, staring that guy down. And the devil walks up to him and the devil goes, aren't you scared of me? Aren't you frightened by me? He goes, no, I've been married to your sister for the last 50 years. (laughs) Oh, cheesy church joke. All right, so here's the thing. If some of you all feel like It might be your spouse or somebody else who's actually the devil in your life. Can we just call it what it is? The devil is the devil, and there are things that we fight against on this world that we should not fight against. There there are battles that we're having that we should never have. There are difficult times, and it's not your coworker that's the problem. It's the enemy who is at work. I remember we had a copy machine at the church I used to work at, and there was a section for regular paper and a section for cardstock. And for whatever reason, that was the biggest drama in the office. Was like They would get flip-flopped, and we would print off copies and copies on cardstock, and then the administrative team would get mad, and the business department would get involved. And there was so much staff fighting over what kind of paper was going into the printing machine. And we realized the problem's not the paper. The problem is that the church was thriving and the devil wanted to shut down the church. And the moment we started to pray and ask for the Lord to show up, it was amazing how that conflict just began to completely disappear and we were able to focus on the right things. So let's hone in on our verse for today, which is verse 12. It says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You notice that it doesn't say that Republicans are the problem. Some of y'all got tight on that one. I'll try it again. You notice it says that the Democrats are not the problem. You notice that it doesn't say that Elon Musk is the problem. It doesn't say these things, regardless of your view on it. People are always pointing fingers at all of these things that are earthly, and the problem is not earthly things. The problem is there is a devil that wants to steal, kill, and destroy, and that is the root of things. And if we're going to take this on, we have to fight the right battle. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4 says, For we walk in the flesh. We are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. I wish the church would recognize that Facebook is not where we fight our battles. Like it's real. There are people that spend more time crafting Christian posts than they do on their knees praying for God to move. There are people that spend more time reading their feed than actually being fed by what the Lord has for them out of his word. And we tend to fight things the wrong way. Like we know it in concept, but in praxis, we get it backwards. We need to be people that are fighting the right battle the right way. And so I have three points that I want to give you uh, this morning. The first one is spiritual warfare is normal. Can we just, how many of you feel like you're under spiritual attack? Can I just get a, raise hands real quick? Anybody here feel like you have experienced spiritual attack in the last year? Anybody? Yeah. Like, welcome to the club. Like, we, we experience spiritual warfare. It is normal. And what happens sometimes is when you take a step forward in your faith, that's when the spiritual attack really ramps up. Like, that's when it gets really, really difficult. Like, you get saved, and all of a sudden, the attacks start coming. Or you take a step forward in water baptism, and then things begin to have difficulties. Or you trust God with your finances and start giving, and that's when your paycheck goes down. And it's because the moment that you start living for the Lord is the moment when the attacks start coming. And if you're just coasting through right now, being like, man, this life is easy. I don't feel any spiritual warfare at all. You better check yourself, because you may be the person that's on the wrong team. I'm just saying that right now. All right, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10. It says, Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I forgive anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. So it's this context of forgiveness. So that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his design. So in the context of forgiveness, we're just using this as an example. Paul is writing to this church at Corinth, and he's saying forgiveness is the the one side of the equation, but The other side is that there is an enemy out there that wants to point you guys against each other. That that forgiveness is just the outcome of the spiritual attack that is already present right there. And so if you are experiencing difficulty or challenges, it is very, very normal for us to think, okay, what are the spiritual implications of that? 
That should be a way that we retrain ourselves that when there are difficulties, we go, okay, where's the spiritual root? Where's the spiritual root? Because the, the level of attack exposes the level of ability you have in your life. I used to think that as I matured in my faith, spiritual attacks would get easier. But the reality is, as you grow in your faith, you become more of a threat to the enemy. And the moment you become more of a threat to the enemy is the moment he wants to take you down. And when you're on the front lines, there is a good indicator that the devil wants you to stop. And so your level of attack is oftentimes related to your level of ability. And he does that not because of your past. The devil's not scared of your past. Can you, can you get this real quick? The devil's not scared of your past. He's scared of your future. He is scared of where God is taking you. He's scared of the fruit that's still to come, those dreams that God's put inside of you. He's not scared of the troubles of yesterday. He's scared of the promise of where he's going to bring you. And that's why we need to normalize this idea of spiritual warfare so that we can get on the offense with it. One last thing on that is attacks often happen right before a breakthrough. Right before a breakthrough. I, I could go on story after story after story of times when our church or our family was about to see a breakthrough and what the seven days before that looked like. So, so I encourage you with this, that if you're in a season right now of difficulty, get ready because breakthrough is coming. Number one, spiritual warfare is normal. Number two, spiritual attack must be named. You remember when Jesus was talking with one of his buddies and they're just kind of shooting the breeze about different things of faith and heaven. And all of a sudden, Jesus like flips out and he goes, get behind me, Satan. Like, now, I wouldn't say that you should probably say that to your spouse. That's not a good marriage building move right there. But, but what, I, what I would say is that you got to call out who he is. You need to call out the devil. You need to call out the influence that he's having in things around you. Ephesians 6, 12, we read it once. We're going to read it again. Look at how high level these demonic forces are right here. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil. There, there are some pretty big things that are out there to steal what God has for us. So the thing that I need to wrestle with and that maybe you need to wrestle with is how do we determine when it is a spiritual attack or whether it's us just going through a regular season? And I often wonder that. I'm going, okay, God, is this a season where I'm under attack or not? And here's some things that I use as kind of a way to check this out. Uh, if you're confused about something, if you're in a season of confusion, that is definitely a sign that it is from the devil. Because we don't serve a God of confusion. We serve a God of order. We serve a God who is a lamp unto our feet. He makes our path straight. We can lean on these promises. And if our life is functioning different than those promises, for me, that's a key going, okay, there's some sort of spiritual work against me right now. I need to lean into Jesus a little bit more. A uh, second one is when you don't have peace. Because we serve a God of what? A God of? All right, you guys know the answer now. We serve a God of? All right, you're with me. So if you're, if you're having moments where you're, you're not filled with peace, that is a good check to say, okay, there are spiritual forces that are against me right now. The devil doesn't want this decision-making process to go correctly. Uh, another one is when you feel like quitting. I don't know if I'm the only one, but there's some days where I wake up and I'm like, man, this is difficult. I'd love just to sleep in for a month or two. That'd be really, really nice. And, and quitting is, you know, right in front of me, and I think about doing this, but then I think about Jesus. And I think about right before he went to the cross, how he's praying to the Father, saying, God, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this, but your will be done. He goes, he faces trial, he's on the cross, and he takes it all the way to where? All the way to where it says, it is finished. He went all the way. He was not a quitting God. I am so glad that God has not quit on me. He's not going to quit on you. And that gives me the courage and the strength to be able to go all the way when it comes to my faith. Uh, another one that's a great indicator is when you're facing temptation. It just seems like temptation comes at the most difficult moments. And that's because the devil knows when you are struggling. The devil knows when times are hard. When did the devil tempt Jesus? right at the end of that 40-day period where he has not been eating, he hasn't been drinking, he's depleted, he's in a weak moment. The temptation was a great sign that the enemy was against him. The last one I'm going to throw there is old lifestyle. When you start to look back at the lifestyle that you used to have, it's an indicator that the enemy is after you. 
because the Bible says that you are a new creation in Christ. The old has gone, the new has come. And if I could just share this to our, our present society right now, we have a society where long-suffering or longevity is not baked into our culture as it used to be. That when you're five, ten years into the marriage and it becomes difficult, you back out of it. And you think that maybe the Lord is leading you that direction. And I would say absolutely not. You are finding yourself in a job where people used to have a career that would last for decades. You get into the first difficult rift and you go, mm, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and get an upgraded job right now. Or maybe you're having some sort of uh, thing with your house or your car or all sorts of other things that could be present. We tend to want to continually upgrade and upgrade rather than actually navigating through the difficult parts. And so when you have these challenges of confusion or a lack of peace or wanting to quit, that is a great indicator that on the other side of that long suffering is a breakthrough that will produce tremendous fruit. But we need to name what that is. It is the devil that wants to lead us off track. Now that you've gotten all the bad news, can I encourage you guys for a moment? No? One person. I'm just going to speak right to you and encourage you. Spiritual victory can be normal. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. We read it before. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. You need weapons in your life to be able to fight the enemy. And we're going to look in the next couple of weeks what it is to equip ourselves and put on the full armor of God. But I need to get you guys some tools right now. So I would get your, get your phone out, get your pen, paper, whatever you got, smoke signal. I want you guys to get some of these things in because these are going to be things that you can apply to your life right now. The first thing is, can we just talk about the power of the name of Jesus for a moment? The power of the name of Jesus. Mark chapter 16 says, and these signs will accompany those believers in my name. They will cast out demons. There are things that can't happen in other names. If you flex the name of Yardley, you're not getting so far. Like, I like that name. I think it's pretty good. It's not going to do you much good to flex that name. You might get an extra charge on something because I owe a bill somewhere. But if you use the name of Jesus, come on, there is power found in the name of Jesus. There is victory found in the name of Jesus. There is new beginnings that are found in the name of Jesus. Marriages are restored in the name of Jesus. Chains are shattered in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is sufficient to take on whatever this world can throw at it. And when we call things out in the name of Jesus, things change. John 16 says, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, in the name of Jesus, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So when you're, when you're wrestling through things, which I know none of you have, but you guys over here who wrestle with things, all right? Are you praying in the name of Jesus? Are you calling the name of Jesus, pleading the name of Jesus over your circumstances? When, you're, when your kids are having issues, I'm going, in the name of Jesus, Satan, get behind me. Will they be filled with your love and your grace? Will they understand the wonderful commandment of how to honor your father and mother? Like, I'm just, I'm praying the name of Jesus over them. Because every other name has simply ended and is still on the ground, but he's the only name that's conquered the grave. Are you praying for things in the name of Jesus? The second one, word of God. The word of God, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. I am not a sword expert. I don't know the difference between a single and a double-edged sword, but I'm choosing the double. It just sounds better. Piercing to the division of soul and spirit and joint and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When Jesus was tempted and when Jesus was struggling, what was his go-to? He said, it is written. If Jesus' technique for defending the devil was to say it is written, I believe we should have the exact same mindset, that we should know the scriptures to a point where we can instantly combat those thoughts with the word of God. How many of us are smartphone users? How many of you believe that smartphones make you dumber? 
It is ridiculous. If I could burn that thing, I would. They are. Mm. What I've seen is that when I have a problem, I will simply look up the scripture on it, and I have scriptures that are written on the tablet of my phone, not on the tablets of my heart. When are you having the discipline of saying, okay, here's an issue that I'm having. Here's a reoccurring attack that I have. I'm going to take that scripture. I'm going to memorize it. So when the devil attacks me, I'm ready to go, locked and loaded, right here inside of me. I can quote that scripture instantly. Do you have the word of God as a tool to be able to fight in the spiritual realms? Jesus replied that way. And the devil's first technique for fighting Adam and Eve was to challenge God's word. God's word is always the same. It never changes we need to understand it. 2 Corinthians 10.5, For we destroy every argument and lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We need to make sure that we have the word of God as something we can stand on. Third one, prayer. Matthew 18, 19 through 20. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Those are Jesus' words, not my words. What I know is that we is better than me. And I, I struggle to pray for myself. Anybody else like that? Like, it's like I could pray for all the other things, but it's difficult to pray for yourself. Like, for me, I, ch I struggle to do that. You know what else I struggle with? I can pray for everybody else's needs, but I don't want to share my needs with other people. And we, we want to, I don't know if it's because we want to paint this picture that we have it all together, but let's just be real. We got some things that are going on. We got some struggles that are happening. There's some difficulties out there, and I need to have people that I can share these things with so that we are praying for them together. And there's power found in prayer. It's not the afterthought. It should be our default response. We are talking about the name of Jesus. We're finding what the word of God says, and then we are coming together, and we are praying over, and we are praying through those things. Now, this is the kind of message that builds some good roots. You know what's really exciting? Any gardeners? I, I, I'm a terrible gardener. My wife's awesome at it. Uh, what's really exciting is the moment that you plant flowers. Like, they look really, really good. You're like, that looks awesome. I like flowers. They're pretty. They smell nice. That's a good moment. The moment that's not as entertaining is when the roots under the ground that you can't see are getting a firm grip on the soil to be able to support what's already taken place. I want to make sure that we celebrate the flowery stuff like baptisms, but that we're also growing the roots that support us next week. I want to make sure that we're the kind of church where we celebrate Jesus on Easter, but we have the roots to where we can make it through the summer and into September. We want to make sure that we have the right roots that are present, and prayer is one of those that will do that. Uh, worship team, you guys can go ahead and come on up right now. The next one I want to share, and this is the last one, and depending on your musical background, this is either going to be one you love or you hate, praise and worship. All the people that are up here love it, which is great. Just a little bit right here. Okay. In life, you can either whine about things or you can worship about things. And you can spell that W-H-I-N-E. For some of y'all, it might be W-I-N-E. All right. You can either whine about things or you can worship about things. And some of y'all are going to get that like two weeks later. Oh, that's what he meant. All right. Real talk in my mind for a second. When I'm up here on Sundays, right here, and I'm worshiping, what I know is that people normally figure out that that seat is safe for the person that's speaking. And people tend to look at what that seat is doing. And I, I'm in that seat, and sometimes I'm like, what are they going to think if I raise my hands? Anybody else think that in worship? Like just being real, like you're raising your hands and you're worshiping Jesus and you're like, I wonder if the person behind me thinks I'm a freak. I wonder if the live stream, who picks up the first and second row, no one's going to sit in these two rows next week. I, I wonder if they're going, man, I wonder who's watching online, who's watching my behavior right now. And how I know this is spiritual is that you would never question that when it comes to cheering for other things. But when it comes to cheering for the goodness of God, we subconsciously second guess things. And I tell you, it's not because of my thoughts, it's because the devil puts these little things inside of me. And so on Sunday, I, I gotta pump myself up because worshiping that way at, at home, no big deal. 
You all should see the, the yardly praise dances that go on. Lord have mercy. We can take a laps around that living room that you don't even know about. But here on Sunday, I gotta gear myself up sometimes because I'm gonna worship Jesus out of principle, not because I'm feeling a certain way about it. James chapter four says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. We are in a war right now. You may not see it, but I hope you perceive it. There is an enemy that wants to take you down and take this church down, take our country down, take our world down. But I'm going to do everything I can to be ready to rumble. I'm going to do everything I can to be prepared for the battle that I know is coming. And so I'm going to make sure that I'm claiming the name of Jesus. I'm going to make sure that I'm in the Word preparing myself. I'm going to make sure that I'm linking arms with other people and praying through these things. And I'm going to make sure that I'm praising God like He's the God who saved my soul. Anybody with me on that? If you're experiencing any sort of spiritual attack, I want you to stand right now. Don't leave me to second guess. Just stand up. take that I was like, actually I'm, I'm going to hold off, hold off for one second on this <laughs> what I love is that we all knew that we're under spiritual attack but we're like man, man I wonder if that person next to me feels like they're under spiritual attack we're, we're all in this together we are all in this together as people that are wrestling and so I invite you to put your palms up towards heaven and whatever this battle is that's going on you know it the Lord knows it. The devil is the root of it. That person is not the root. That thing that happened to you is not the root. That thing in your mind is not the root. It's the devil that is the root of that. And so we are surrendering this to God, saying, Lord, would you create a breakthrough? God, would the devil flee from me? Would this moment be gone in the name of Jesus? We are choosing to fight our battles this way this morning.